from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this special CUBE Conversation here in the CUBE studios here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE. We have a special series we're starting called Demystifying Cloud Native. And I'm joined with my co-host of this series, Dominic Tornow, Principal Engineer C with Cisco, Office of the CTO. Dominic, thanks for joining me. Thanks for agreeing to participate in this awesome series around demystifying cloud native. Thanks. Hey, thanks for having me. So cloud native is hot, but it's changing. It's super important. Some people have a definition here or there. What is your definition of cloud native? Well, for, uh, to define cloud native, Let's use a mechanical approach, right? So we are talking about cloud native applications. So the first question there would be, what is cloud, right? And uh, I personally define the cloud as uh, a service provider that allows a service consumer to dynamically um, acquire and release resources. Now, from that point, uh, with that definition in mind, we can define uh, three related concepts. That would be public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud. So the public cloud is a service provider outside of your organization. The private cloud is a service provider inside your organization. And the hybrid cloud is a union of both. So with this definition, we can define a cloud application. And a cloud application then is any application that runs on a cloud provider. Right? But now, what is a cloud native application? Right? If I take a classical application and put it on the cloud, it becomes a cloud application by definition, but it doesn't become a cloud native application. If we want to grok cloud native applications, right? we got to grok a concept that is responsiveness. Responsiveness is very close to availability, but the term availability is highly overloaded. So uh, I personally like to talk about responsiveness. And responsiveness is the ability of an application to hit its service level agreements. Typically, it's response time, right? A, a typical service level agreement, maybe 90% of my requests need to be um, served within 250 milliseconds. So that is the responsiveness of an application. And now we can define scalability and reliability. Scalability is uh, responsiveness under load. And reliability is responsiveness under failure. And now to close the loop, we can define cloud native. And my definition of a cloud native application is a cloud application that is um, scalable and reliable by construction. Dominic, what is your view on hybrid versus multi-cloud? Because that's something that we see a lot in the uh, industry around um, hybrid being public-private, a uh, union of that, you mentioned that. But the talk of multi-cloud is being kicked around a lot. What's the reality of multi-cloud? Is that just, I have multiple clouds? What's the impact to development teams and companies as they think about hybrid and multi-cloud? So um, the hybrid cloud, right, is an instance of a multi-cloud because uh, by definition, you have uh, multiple cloud providers that make up the multi-cloud and in a hybrid cloud, uh, you have at least one public and uh, at least one uh, private cloud. And uh, of course, uh, the implications, whether it's uh, public to public or public to private cloud, are huge. It does affect your, um, your application all the way from the architecture down to the way how you operate your application, right? And uh, when it comes to, to multi-cloud, we are looking at uh, um, significant challenges when it comes to um, the uh, operation uh, automation and the federation between the clouds. What do you think about um, the role Kubernetes is going to play uh, in the enterprise? Because right now, uh, it's really, I think, one of the most popular, if not the most de facto things I've seen in many, many years. Uh, I think it's, to me, I think, the only thing I think about that's Im impactful as Kubernetes is going way back to TCP IP, what that meant for uh, inter-networking, which spawned massive change, massive wealth creation, massive computing capabilities, essentially created networking subnets, and as we know, networking as we know it. 
Kubernetes has that same feel to it mm -hmm. in a whole nother kind of modern way. It seems to be something that people are getting behind in a de facto, it's not officially a standard, I guess what it could be, how important, what's the big deal around Kubernetes? What's your thoughts on oh, this? Oh, Kubernetes, uh, so Kubernetes is definitely something that is exciting in the ecosystem because it puts uh, cloud native in all of our reach, right? With Kubernetes, cloud native is up for grabs, all right? A cloud, uh, any, any application, when you just put it on Kubernetes, it won't become a cloud native application uh, um, just by containerization. Right? But Kubernetes provides so many primitives that actually allow you to uh, address the challenge of scalability and allow you to address the uh, challenge of reliability. And on top of that, it has, as you mentioned, the energy in the ecosystem. Right? And uh, with Kubernetes, if you architect uh, your application uh, right, you do have a chance to um, efficiently, cost efficiently, and also effort efficiently have a cloud native application that is scalable and reliable by construction. And if you think about it, um, scalable and reliable by construction, that requires your application to be able to A, detect um, uh, load and failure, and B, mitigate load and failure. And now if you take Kubernetes and you take it apart and you look under the hood, you see that the Kubernetes primitives are actually designed for that, right? They allow you to, uh, they allow the application to scale itself. They allow the application to actually recover from failure. You do have to ap uh, architect your application um, that way. If your application cannot handle partial failure, your container comes down and with your container, you're actually losing, uh, you're losing vital state in your application. Kubernetes cannot help you with that. But if you architect it correctly, Kubernetes will never stop trying to actually meet your demand. How, that's a great point. How has Kubernetes changed the relationship between the application and the application developer's requirements? Because I think a lot of people see Kubernetes as this, this silver bullet. Oh my God, Kubernetes is going to solve all my problems. That's not really what it is there for. You're kind of getting at that. Detecting failure, understanding events. These are things that are super important, but the application folks have to do the work. Can you just unpack that relationship between the, I'm the app builder. What's my relationship with the Kubernetes? <laughs> A love-hate relationship, <laughs> because Kubernetes is going to help you a lot, but Kubernetes also demands a lot, right? So explain um, that. The, the demands a lot. What does he mean by that? Um, the architectures that we are uh, used to. Uh, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> it demands a lot. It demands a lot. The architectures uh, that we are used to uh, need to change. And uh, if, you, if you come from, let's say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, right? Um, and we are building a reactive application, which at that point would just be called a web application. Uh, you, have a, you have a request coming in and the uh, web server um, taking that request and basically spawning the request context. In that request context, um, your application is still sequential, right? And uh, if everything fails, the database is here to save the day, mm -hmm. the transaction is here to save the day, and will prevent you from, from running into any inconsistencies. Now, if we are in a, in a, microservice, uh, a microservice architecture world, right, multiple uh, different microservices, no transactions there to save the day, you have to, uh, you have to architect with that reality in mind. Kubernetes cannot provide an, an abstraction that make the reality of distributed applications disappear and look like uh, one local application. It cannot. However, it can support you if you got the application architecture right. It can support you to actually bring the, uh, the application to life. And in that case, I do like to, to uh, differentiate between system, application, and platform. The application is all the bits that you build, right? The platform is all the bits that run your application. And it is the system, basically the combination, once the application and the platform are composed, right, that uh, has, is now scalable and reliable by construction. And you can rely on a lot of pieces when it comes to, uh, to Kubernetes um, to actually make this a reality. So as people are out there thinking about um, cloud native, this modern error is upon us. We've seen observability 
become a very important topic. And that, you know, that's basically network management in my mind, but it, we've seen observability have its own category and there's been successes out there. PagerDuty, SignalFX all got liquid, all these ventures got, got successes. Automation is another area. How do you see the interplay between automation and observability? Because Kubernetes has a lot of things going on. Applications are going to have a lot more services happening with microservices and other things. Observability and uh, automation are two important concepts. Besides orchestration, Kubernetes, the observability and automation, how do you see those fitting into that cloud native uh, architecture? So observability, when we hear observability, right, we should ask ourselves the question, well, who is the observed and who is the observer? And uh, classically, if you think of the observer, we think about ourselves, right? We have either the developers and we have an, or we have an operations team, and it is the operations team that is fed the data from, uh, uh, from the uh, observability tool set, right? However, now if we bring operations into the mixture, and especially operation automation, we can close the loop between observability automation operation, and again, observability. That is uh, the, the uh, observability tool set, right? Monitoring uh, the application feeds into the, uh, into the um, operation of the application in order to actually, again, orchestrate parts of the application. And here with Kubernetes is actually uh, the, the perfect example. And a very simple example mm -hmm. is um, auto-scaling. So uh, auto scaling uh, on, on Kubernetes, we are basically just monitoring uh, either metrics uh, like for example, CPU um, load or memory pressure or CPU load and memory load, or we are looking into application metrics like the messages queued up in a message queue. And this is now the indicator for uh, Kubernetes to actually scale up more pods on demand or scale down more pods on demand. And uh, yes, this is not rocket science. We had this, uh, we had this for a while. Yet uh, with Kubernetes and its extensibility, right, we can take that further and further down um, up from a, from a very generic level where we have uh, auto scaling on a very generic level to an absolutely uh, application specific uh, or use case specific level if uh, you dig into Knative, for example, uh, you will actually quickly discover that Knative is, or especially Knative Serving, one of the subsets on Knative, is uh, a uh, operations automation uh, platform for microservice applications on Kubernetes. And again, it feeds the observability into the operation and the operation into the observability. They work hand in hand. They work hand in hand. Dominic, I want to ask you, uh, put you on the spot here with a question. Um, so take your time to think about this. Um, what is the most important uh, story or thread or topic or interest that people should pay attention to in this cloud native uh, wave? And the second part is, what's the most important thing that people need to be paying attention to they might not be pay being paying attention to? Well, unfortunately, I think I have to disappoint you. The one most important one is uh, actually very hard to find. It will influence everything. It will influence your organization. It will influence the architecture of your application. It will uh, influence how you operate these applications uh, and uh, how you move forward with new versions. So uh, which one is the most uh, important one or the most significant one very much depends on your role. But uh, there is absolutely no question that uh, the cloud native journey affects all of these roles. So then you could argue that the top story is that cloud native is a completely new operating model different from the old way of doing it. Yes. Do you agree with that? I, I very much agree I mean, with some that. Some people think like cloud native, I don't even know what that is. I'm, I, I'm in the 1990s with my IT department and my application developers still running single threaded yeah, mainframes. You know, uh, based on the definition, doesn't the definition actually sound pretty innocent, right? Scalable and reliable by construction. That actually doesn't sound like it's magic dust and that also doesn't sound too hard. But once you actually start uncovering and uh, um, dive into what that actually means, right? Then uh, you see that the, uh, the, the implications of that, right? Uh, are far reaching. It starts from uh, UX engineering to, software engineering to the operations 
and uh, uh, will affect the entire organization uh, and organization. Let's just up. say you and I are having a beer. Um, it's Oktoberfest. You know, we're having a beer, and you and I say, "Hey, I, you know, I got to get modern with my IT. My boss is, you know, banging down my my, my door saying we need to go cloud native. We got to get modern applications, but we're running old school IT." Dominic, what do I do? Give me some advice. What what's the playbook? What's your what would you tell me? Oh, um, playbook is uh, again actually fairly hard because uh, on the one side we are actually not very far into this journey. So uh, it is not necessarily that there is uh, a lot of chapters in this playbook to choose from. And uh, the other one is um, you have to give your IT department the possibility to actually re-architect the entire system. Of course, this is a step-by-step -step journey and uh, you cannot do this overnight. But if you want to arrive at a truly cloud native uh, um, destination, you actually have to walk the entire cloud native journey. Talk about the intersection between design and development. Because this, again, if, if everything's flipped upside down where applications are in charge, UX and UI are important. UX, meaning thinking about the user experience engineering, is super critical to get that done up front, just like security. If security is being done on the front end, baked into everything, doesn't UX have to be baked into everything? If that's the case, that's again a dynamic. So what's your take on that development and design intersection? Remember 15 years ago? It was like, when do we bring in a UX designer? At the end of the project. <laughs> At the absolute end of the project, exactly. So we have it ready, and then we have only one demand, make it pretty, right? So, Obviously, that didn't work great. Well, I mean, that made sense. You think about the web. Web was very limited at the time, HTML, and you had some interactive, base interactive features, so it was limited tool set then. Uh, at that time, it did work, but it was still not ideal. Yeah, I agree. Um, right. <laughs> but uh, now we actually, we, we, need to flip, uh, uh, we need to flip the playbook there on its head. And uh, I would argue that as an application developer, um, my boss, so to say, the one who is giving me the requirements are the uh, UX engineers by now. So the UX engineers are the ones right, that, uh, that determine the, the, functional, the functional requirements of my application. Now, as an as a application engineer, I still determine uh, A, security, and B, also the uh, non-functional uh, requirements of my application. And once again, we come to um, reliability, or we come to scalability and reliability by construction. So um, we also need to start working hand in hand together. So um, UX uh, and uh, uh, UX design or design and development. Um, looking uh, looking at design and development, you see there is somewhat of a misalignment to begin with. UX uh, design is responsible for uh, building the right thing and uh, development is responsible for building the thing right. right. So uh, in that case, we are almost uh, orthogonal on our way. Right? And uh, in the, the, the cloud native world actually forces us together. And as a simple example, if you look at one web page now, that may actually be served by multiple microservices. So given the possibility of partial failure, right, will the page come up or will the page not come up is actually not a binary condition or a binary decision anymore. Right? Parts of the page may be up, parts of the page may be down. Is that, is that uh, critical? Is the page still viable or is it not? That is uh, for the UX designer to decide and I am here to help them. So how does the balance get um, aligned? How do you realign that you're saying bring in UX to lead the application development, then to the application developer, then to the development team? It uh, actually has to be very short uh, feedback cycle. So I personally uh, argue for uh, designers uh, and developers um, 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 going along that journey together. So there shall not be a handoff. Once there is an actual handoff, um, you already lost. So cloud native, we're bringing everything together, UX, the front end, applications taking control, infrastructure as code. This paradigm's significant. This is here to stay for the next generation or two at least. 
Yes, this paradigm actually does change how we approach software engineering uh, at large. All right, we're going to dig into more of it. There's plenty more to talk about. We've got KubeCon coming up in San Diego, Istio, service meshes, stateful applications, a lot more stuff to talk about. Dominic, thanks for, for uh, having this conversation. Demystifying Cloud Native here with Dominic Tornell, Principal Engineer at Cisco, Office of the CTO. I'm John Furrier, theCUBE, thanks for watching.